Hello and welcome to the Politics Series, where I talk about more abstract political ideas that may or may not apply to the current uh, climate. Here, I'm going to talk a little bit about antagonism and the idea of like checks and balances being applied to things uh, past just the American government. So as we already know, checks and balances, great idea. Uh, in the American government, we have our three uh, branches of the government, arguably four if you want to count the, bureauc the bureaucracy, but we're going to stick with three just to make things kind of simple. You have the executive, you have the legislative, and you have the judicial. These, these branches have checks on one another to essentially control the amount of power that the other one has. And the general powers of governing are split between these branches so that we have so that we have so so that one branch doesn't get carried away and starts legislating everywhere now of course at the time i'm making this video the judicial branch aka the supreme court in this case has been kind of going a little bit buck wild with their policies but that's not what this video is about i just want to talk i just kind of brought up the three branches of the government because it is the most accessible form of uh checks and balances that i think everybody is vaguely aware of at the very least if you're if you are an american citizen or you participate in a government that mimics the american government checks and balances are generally a good thing when they're done correctly but when we talk about checks and balances i think what's really what we tend to forget is we tend to forget how checks and balances and this sort of this sort of antagonism, we'll call it, can apply to things outside of our elected and, in the Supreme Court's case, appointed governments. Antagonism is what I'm going to call this concept of sort of pitting institutions against one another to temper to temper the power of both. So, where does this come into play? Power, specifically, right? Where is power, where does power, like, like sort of tend to concentrate outside of regular old government? Well, power, power is very interesting. Power in the United States and in most of the world also comes quite a bit from money. And a lot of the reasons, I think, why the, the government can get corrupt and, and may not represent our views is because moneyed interests influence politicians to support things that they may or may not otherwise support and or believe in for the sake of the politicians' own financial success. This, this, this money comes from corporations and individually wealthy people who obtained that wealth from, you know, high positions in a corporation. So, let's talk about how we temper power in other institutions and see if we can kind of apply this to corporations. So, like with checks and balances, you need to pit institutions against one another to temper their power. Outside of just corporations, we can also uh, um, uh, include this. Uh, uh, um, uh, we can um, so okay. So so the actual way that you would temper the power of a corporation is to essentially strip away their right to dictate uh, the conditions of labor. Now we have this idea when it comes to labor laws, right? Um, factory workers, a lot of blue collar workers tend to have uh, uh, some kind of collective bargaining uh, apparatus where everybody in the labor workforce part of the company will agree to to step away from doing work, thereby thereby tanking the company's profits, to um, so that they can they can maybe get a higher share of the profits that they generate. 
this this type of antagonism, this type of uh, 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 the creation of the collective bargaining institution and the already established uh, sort of corporate power and and those two ideas pitting pitting pit against each other allows for a more equitable uh sort of outcome better um fairer treated workers will work better and will stay in the company longer thereby providing more value to the company thereby helping the company profit a little bit more well maybe not a little bit more but will help the company profit a little more stably and the company's profits can be used probably not to help out the workers necessarily because these collective bargaining agreements don't don't necessarily work like that but those profits can still allow the uh, institution of the corporation to expand their own reach expand their own market etc etc it's this antagonism allows both institutions to temper one another's power and work towards a common goal. And I think that we don't apply this very often to much of anything. I think that we, we sort of write off things like labor power and we write off things like, another great example, the power of the press. During the, during the 2016 and during the 2016 and the 2020 elections, we talked so much. We talked so much about how the press and social media and stuff impact this, the uh, 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 Im, 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 impact the sort of, of um, landscape of like political thought, right? You know, not a lot of people like sit down and read like political theory or have any like significant education in political theory. A lot of people get their news from newspapers, well, not so much newspapers anymore, but from the internet, from social media, from from the television, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But do we ever focus on how inter how that power is really allocated? How many checks and balances are there on social media? How many checks and balances are there on the news media? Right? I've read part of Manufacturing Consent, uh, mostly the part that talks a little bit about where, why the media sort of curtails, not curtails, but sort of like tailors its perspective towards a certain goal as opposed to um, sort of evenly covering most perspectives, maybe with a, a, a bias towards the truth. And what I gained from that, and for the record, I will read the rest of the book. It's just, I just haven't read the rest of the book yet. Um, what I gathered from that is that, you know, the, 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 the media does have some checks on its power, but they, but they aren't very, but they aren't very great institutional checks on power. A lot of their, uh, a lot of the things that 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 check the media in power, or well, used to at least, because manufacturing consent was written a little like a, like like I think a little bit before social media really really had an impact on things. But you know, through like flack and through like financial interests, through advertising, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But these but these sorts of checks on media are a little soft, right? Because, because if a media apparatus gets big enough, they start to be able to call the shots. They start to be able to be a little more risky in what they're allowed to say. Once we incorporate social media into it, the checks and balances part becomes harder to enforce. Uh, at least in the way that we kind of un 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 understand it now. The fact of the matter is, is that these... Um, you know these like very like like reactionary right wing sources may may be taken off of mainstream platforms, but their audiences will still by and large if they buy into the uh, beliefs that they're espousing. 
will 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 follow them onto platforms that 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 are willing to sort of host their views. So I don't know what the solution is when it comes to social media. I think it's pretty obvious what it is when it comes to, say, labor power and corporation. The antagonism is still there because, because the corporation needs people to, to do the job and people don't and, and people need a job so that they're able to earn money to afford one thing or another. But when it comes to the news media, but when it comes to the news media, when it comes to the constant splintering of of sort of political views, the 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 sort of um, I forget the exact word, but the sort of the ability of the news media to kind of section itself off and retain its audience and still be able to last. The nuclearization, we'll call it. The, the nuclearization, whatever. Is, I think, a lot harder to control. I think oftentimes... Um, and this was supposed to be about like sort of checks and balances and power and stuff, but I'm going a little off the rails here. Uh, I think a lot of times um, when we talk about, say, like the news media and how to sort of control it, there is a question out there, you know, about like what is truth? What is, you know, like what, like what is correct? What is wrong? And it's just very, and a lot of people on the center and even, you know, on like, center left and center right but like people like in that center um political positions tend to talk a lot about how truth is not one thing how truth is not objective and stuff and and although i'm i'm tempted to agree with that right like there are a lot of perspectives out there and there are a lot of things that we need to uh take into consideration to find something that is more true than something else i think that there is a lot to be said about, although there not being an objective truth, there is, we should be able to hinge on certain institutions to, to give us something as close as possible to the truth. But I don't know how to solve it when when news outlets splinter off and section off into very, very, very specific and often very reactionary uh, ideas. Yeah. The checks and balances argument, the, the whole idea of, of one institution being the antagonist to one or more institutions thereby tempering everybody's power is a really good idea i like to think and you know i think i came up with it on my own but i'm not but i wouldn't be surprised and in fact i i would be uh i would it would make more sense to me if if this was something that was either implicitly told to me or something that somebody came up with way before but it has it has its flaws because uh, of course there are there there are some things that that splinter off like the news media d does but there are also things that um but but there are also but there's this also but, uh, we could also relate this sort of a antagonism thing to like the market economy right like this like this like great great sort of sort of selling point of like capitalism and market economies is this idea that competition will ultimately drive prices down now although that is true in theory or at least in some economic school of thought we all know it really isn't right because because collections of companies in the same industry can, can, can form a block can, can form a trust and have essential complete power over the market and if you know 
these companies have a big enough market share, like collectively, you know, they can dictate the the market. Uh, they can kind of bend the market to their will, right? So, in that same sense, I mean, the government does that too. Now, of course, the government is composed of political parties, and I know that, like, SCOTUS isn't supposed to be politically biased, but they are politically biased. They've never not been politically biased, and I think thinking anything like that is um, naive. Um, but yeah, but, like, SCOTUS is politically biased. The presidency is politically biased. Uh, the the legislative branch is explicitly politically biased, and um, the the bureaucracy is as well. well. Why am I bringing this up? Because despite that political sort of bias, you will have infighting and that kind of antagonism, tempering of uh, this or that within those political um arenas <clears throat> but the problem kind of comes in when everybody's collective goal that they're working towards is their own personal financial safety establishment financial sort of root of power because money as we sort of as people like people or institutions collect money has this sort of permanent influence on our world. We're sort of, it's this sort of absolute power that doesn't really have any checks or balances. And corporations are the most explicit in how they chase after the money for that reason. But um but um but because money is such a permanent sort of standing of power it seems to me that the institutions that we kind of that that kind of go after one another can be can be bought and and can be bought by institutions with more money. So this whole checks and balances thing, this whole checks and balances thing doesn't really work if there aren't checks being put on everybody everywhere. And even that, I'm not even sure if that's possible, feasible, politically, logically sound. That was a lot. Um, but anyway, yeah, that... That's uh that's the video. That's the uh that's that's the tweet. That's not the tweet. This isn't a tweet. This is a video. Yeah, welcome to the politics series. Uh, sorry sorry for not uploading super a lot. This one was kind of off the cuff. Uh mostly because I I, I just didn't uh I didn't want to write a script for it. I I haven't written a video for this. I've been a little I haven't like written anything for videos or anything yet because I've been a little preoccupied with life as of late. But yeah, thank you all for watching. And, uh, I don't know, subscribe if you feel like it. I look like trash today, but hey. It's okay. I'm gonna take a shower after this. Is that okay to put on the... I just woke up. I wanted to film a video. I didn't leave the house. Alright. I'll see you guys later. Bye. <laughs>